All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, today, as you can see, we're going to talk about discrete probability. We're going to do so for two lectures. So this will be one of two lectures covering discrete probability. It's intuitive to follow up counting and counting methods with discrete probability because probability, along with many other concepts we're, go we're going to cover and concepts we have covered, right, have to do with counting. Uh, and so we'll see the clear relationship between the two and in our first few examples and in the definitions. Um, before we dive in, any questions? All right. And so discrete probability is a concept and probability theory and statistics are used quite a bit in computer science. So it's a good idea to give you guys a crash course in this topic to be sure. Uh, probability theory is used in AI. A lot of AI machine learning pattern recognition methods are based in the fundamentals of statistics and probability theory. Right? This is a huge field. Right? Data science, all of these, right? data analytics, all of these fields are, have many, many methods that are rooted in the basics of statistics and probability theory. So it's important if you are going to pursue right, a career in the area of computer science that you have a good understanding of statistics and probability. And uh, in the area of algorithms, are, there are also randomized algorithms, right? Algorithms uh, which we can bound error, right? Or bound computational time in a statistical sense rather than an exact sense. And so probability theory and statistics is really important in the field of analysis of algorithms as well. Uh, so uh, again, probability theory is used quite ubiquitously in computer science. So we will give you a crash course in this theory. All right, first, a few definitions. I'll go ahead and write them out. And some of the basics in probability theory, we're gonna find an event, and a trial, and a sample space. All right, so first we'll discuss experiments or trials. So an experiment or trial is simply a procedure that yields one outcome from a set of possible outcomes randomly. So a procedure right, and I'll use the word randomly here right here we use the word randomly in some sort of non deterministic sense so a trial would be simply something like rolling a die, right? At the end of rolling a die, you have some outcome. You get a one or a three or a six, something of this nature. Seemingly it's random, seemingly it's non-deterministic. Although you might roll the die multiple times, you get a different outcome, right? So non-deterministic in that sense, right? Or random in that sense, right? Our given set of possible outcomes, right? Is referred to as our sample space. So the sample space, this is analogous to the universe of discourse, it is simply the set of all possible outcomes. Right. And lastly, right, an event is simply a subset of our sample space, very simply and very formally. And so we'll go ahead and do a, a simple example after we define our probability here, right, to motivate these terms we've just learned. And right, so if S is some finite, non-empty sample space right, of equally likely outcomes, right, we'll underline that, and E is some event that is a subset of S, then the probability of E, generally written P of E, where P is a probability function, is simply the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S. So here we're simply counting the number of elements in E, a subset of S, and creating a ratio over the number of elements in S. All right, so let's do a simple example here with rolling a die. We're gonna do a lot of examples with rolling die because it's pretty simple uh, to start off with, and then we'll get to some slightly more complicated examples. So example seven one, what is the probability of rolling a one given a six-sided die? All 
And so, and not a difficult question, but it allows us to use some of these terms and structures that we've just defined and assign them to something that you're familiar with. And so here, what is our sample space? What are all possible outcomes if we roll a die? It's simply the set that contains all possible outcomes, the set that contains one, two, three, four, five, and six. And so whenever answering a probability-based question, statistics-based question, step one, always identify your sample space. Right. Again, here, very simple, very easy. You guys know the answer to this already. Right? But as the questions get more and more complicated, you might try to dive in and, try and start to answer the question without breaking apart the fundamentals, identifying the fundamentals. Step one, always identify your sample space. Step two, always identify the event under consideration. Right? Number one, our sample space is what? Simply the set that contains one, two, three, four, five, and six. Right. So in this example, what is our event in under consideration? Right. Rolling a one. This is what we're concerned with. What is the probability of rolling a one? And given our six-sided die, right? An event is simply a subset of our sample space. So the event here is simply the set that contains one. Right. Excellent. Therefore, given our probability here of equally likely outcomes. Again, here we're assuming that we have a fair die and that each outcome is equally likely. We need only create a ratio of the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S to come up with our probability. Right? Thus, P of E simply equal to the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S, which is simply equal to one over six. Right. If we were to draw a Venn diagram of this, our universe of discourse, which is very much our sample space, right, just simply consists of six singletons. Right. The event under consideration was this one. Right. Just to visually support our, our discussion here. Sometimes it helps to draw out the Venn diagrams. Again, when the questions get slightly more complicated and we start combining events. Yes. I'm guessing the answer is zero. Is there ever a case where the cardinality of E or the cardinality of S would be a false way of finding the event probability? Are you. <clears throat> like, is that formula ever false? Like, like, yes. If the. If the events in our sample space are not equally likely, if the singletons are not equally likely, then this need not be true. Good question. All right, we'll look at a slightly more generalized case of how to compute probabilities when each of the individual outcomes are not equally likely. All right, so let's look at a slightly more complicated but still somewhat simple example. All right, we're gonna build up until we get more and more and more and more complicated. Sample example 7.2, rolling an even number. So assume again that we have a die. What is the probability of rolling an even number? Again, our sample space is simply, assuming that we have a six-sided die, we have one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to six. Right. What is our event space now? Right. We are concerned of what event? We are concerned about rolling an even number. Right. This is a subset of our sample space. Right. All of the numbers that are even in our sample space are two, four, and six. This is our event. Our event is two, four, and six. Again, assuming that we have a fair die and each outcome is equally likely, we have P of E is simply equal to the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S, right? Equal to three over six, equal to one half. Any questions about the basics? And these are the basic terms, sample space, event space, probabilities. All right, let's do one slightly more complicated. In this trial, we're going to roll two die, and we're going to ask the probability of rolling a pair. 
Right. So here our trial. Roll two dice. Event. A pair. And what is the probability? of rolling a pair. And given that we're rolling two die. <clears throat> Again, your initial instinct might be to dive in to try to answer this without identifying the sample space and the event space. This would be a poor idea, right? In a general sense, you might get to the right answer. Right? You might not. Uh, so first, what is our sample space here? Right. So we are rolling two die. What are the, all of the possible outcomes when you roll two die? Yes. So it's all pairwise outcomes of two dice, right? All two tuples representing the outcomes of the two dice, right? In a sense, we have our sample space from the one dice, the sample space of the other die, and we want the Cartesian product of those two sets. Right? So we have essentially S1, the sample space of our one die, which would be one, two, right? That's six. S2, which would be one, two, out to six. All right, our sample space here is simply equal to S1, oops, S1 cross S2, right? Where here we have a Cartesian product. And this is the set that's gonna contain all tuples right, of the singletons of our individual sets. All the elements in S1 followed by all the elements in S2, all of those combinations. Right. So how many of those are we going to get? Well, given our previous discussion of the Cartesian product of two sets, we know that the cardinality of the Cartesian product of two sets is simply equal to the product of the individual cardinalities of the sets. And so if the cardinality of S1 is six and the cardinality of S2 is six, then the cardinality of the Cartesian product is going to be six times six or 36. Right. Again, when we have a two-tuple or any sort of two-dimensional structure, it's intuitive to illustrate it via a table. I would encourage you guys to do something like this, again, whenever attempting to solve right, a problem of this nature. So let's go ahead and draw out that table to give us a good idea or sense of our sample space here. Right, so here, let's say that we're going to put our die one on the bottom and our die two at the top. Right, and so we just simply have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Two, three. Right, and so this first entry in our table, our matrix is simply the first tuple, one, one, right, followed by one, two, right, and on. Here we have two, one, three, one, right, and on, two, two, and on. And at the bottom here, of course, we have six one, six six, and one six. All right, note. And again, we already identified this note that the cardinality of S is equal to 36. We could see this by construction, how we were able to build S using the Cartesian product. We can also see it intuitively by simply exhaustively filling out this table. In some counting and probabilistic problems, it's not going to be possible for us to fill out a table like this. It's just going to be, the sample space is going to be too big. So we're going to have to rely on some of our counting schemes, our simple ways of counting the number of combinations or permutations possible. Right? So rather than exhaustively listing out our sample space or our event space, we'll simply rely on our counting principles and counting methods. Here, though, this is a nice example, a nice illustration. It helps us to wrap our minds around it and feel comfortable with our answer because we'll be able to, to simply count and see. Uh, so here, though, we could also just rely on our, our knowledge of the Cartesian product. And so therefore, we know that S has a cardinality of 36. Right. What about the cardinality of E? Well, again, here, since we're able to write this out exhaustively without too much pain, we can list out E if we wanted to without taking too much time, or we could just simply count. Right? So how many instances right, of pairs do we have in our sample space? Six, right? 
right? And we can see it here along our diagonal, right? These are all of the pairs, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, all the way out to six, six. There are six such tuples in our sample space that meets the requirement of being a pair, right? Anything off this diagonal is not a pair, right? You would have three, one or one, three or something like this, right? These are not pairs, right? So our event space here is all of our pairs, Right. Also note the cardinality of E is simply six. We have six tuples in this set. And thus P of E, assuming that each of these is equally likely, is equal to the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S, six over 36, one over six. All right, any questions about our dice examples? All right. All right, so here we'll, again, extend this a little bit further. We will discuss a problem where we're not going to exhaustively list out our sample space, but rather we're going to rely upon our counting, our counting skills. We are professional counters now. You guys have the ability to count really, really big numbers, like lots of combinations of permutations. So let's do this with a lotto example. There's a lot of possible outcomes when you play the lotto. Right? So let's say that we are playing the lotto and to win this lotto, you have to correctly guess all five numbers, right? Where we have numbers ranging from one to 30. So we have 30 numbers. We have to guess all five of them correctly. Uh, there's no order. So order does not matter. Is that, that's a pretty common rule in the lotto. Is that true? Nobody plays the lotto. Do you got nobody? Yeah, I don't know. I think order doesn't matter, and we'll assume that there's no repeat. So it's like you're just putting these numbers in a bag, right? right. So we need to know how many different ways right, that we can, how many different unique results there are, and then how many ways we can guess all five of them correctly, right? So let's go ahead and write this out. So to win a lotto. Let's say one must guess. Five numbers. All right, we'll say all five numbers correctly. Where each number is drawn from the set one, two, all the way up to thirty. All right. Again, here, for the purposes of this lotto, we would need to specify whether order matters or whether it doesn't and whether there's repeats or not. So here we'll say there's no order and no repeated values. So what is the probability of winning? All right, so what's first? What's step one? Yes, yes. This is like just that the knee jerk reaction you have to say. Identify the, Identify the sample space. That's step one. Identify the sample space. So, what is S? S is all possible outcomes of this lotto. What are all possible outcomes of this lotto? All right, so selecting five from 30, all right? We're not gonna list them out. We're not gonna list out this set, and it's gonna take too long. Note, in order to compute the probability, we only need to know the cardinality of E and the cardinality of S. So rather than try to list out all different ways we can choose five from 30, all right, we're just going to count the number of ways we can choose five from 30. So how many ways? Can one choose five from 30? Right, that is, i.e., what is the cardinality of S? 
the keyword here is choose. How many ways can we choose five from 30? 30, choose five. Right. And so using our C, and I think Rosen likes to use the C, is 30 and choose five. And you'll also see this written, I don't know if, did I introduce the, the parenthesis notation for choose in our, in our counting lectures? I don't recall. You'll sometimes see this like this as well, 30 choose five. You'll also see it like this, 30 choose five. Again, for the purposes of this class, it's fine if you leave it like this. You guys know that this is simply like in factorial, or in this case, 30 factorial over five factorial, 25 factorial. So now we need to know what the probability, or the cardinality, excuse me, of E is. Therefore, we can then compute the probability of E. So given this, right, given what we know about the cardinality of S, can we determine the cardinality of E? We must guess all five numbers correctly. So how many ways can we guess all five numbers correctly in the lotto? Yes. You are right until the very end. So right, there's five numbers. There are five correct numbers. We have to choose five correct numbers. It's gonna be five, choose five. And so five factorial, right, but then divided by five factorial, zero factorial, which is just simply one. And so this is going to be five, choose five. Right. right. If we have to pick all five of the winning numbers correctly, there's five of them. We have to choose all five of them. So out of the five, we have to choose the five. How many ways can you choose five from five just intuitively? Just one way to do that. Right. And of course, we could write this out. This is just simply five factorial over five factorial over zero factorial. Remember, zero factorial is one. And right. we can write this out too. We want zero, 30 factorial over five factorial over 25 factorial. And therefore, P of E, again, assuming that each one of these outcomes is equally likely, we have P of E is equal to the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S. Right? This is simply going to be 1 over, right? and then we have right, this big mess here. I'll, again, we'll just leave it as 30, choose 5. I'll write it out the other way. So my C might look like something else. Right? which is a going to be a very small number, one over 30 choose five. Right, great. Any questions about that? So again, this is intuitively why we're going to follow up our counting with probability theory. Note that in order to answer these questions, we need not exhaustively list out our sample space and our event space, but we can also answer these questions by simply counting the number of elements. This is sufficient as long as we assume that each of the elements, each of our singletons in the event space and sample space are equally likely outcomes. Then we need only count. All right, next we will look at combining events. Any questions before we move on to combining events? And so in our previous examples, we looked largely at individual events and the outcomes and probabilities related to individual events. Right. In a more general sense, we can combine events. And combining events, in some instances, we will want to compute the unions of events or negations of events. Right. First here, we'll look at the negation of an event. So let E be an event. Let me change our color here. There we go. Let E be an event in a sample space S, the probability of the negation of E, so not E happening, right, which we know to be equal to S minus E, that's set difference, so S minus E, right, because again, S is essentially our universe of discourse here, E is a subset of S, so the negation of E is simply, or the complement of E, excuse me, is simply S minus E, right, 
is simply given by 1 minus the probability of E. Right. Why is this true? Well, we can simply prove this. Right. And if we wanted to compute the probability of the complement of E, right, we know that the complement of E is simply equal to S minus E, where S is our sample space, our universe of discourse within this context. Right. We know that the probability is defined to be a ratio of the cardinality. So here we have right, the cardinality of S minus E over the cardinality of S. We know here that we have the cardinality of S minus the cardinality of E over cardinality of S. Right? And this is simply going to be 1 minus the probability of E. It's cardinality of S over the cardinality of S minus the, prob the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S, right? which is just simply 1 minus P of E. And intuitively, this makes sense. If we have some set, again, using a Venn diagram to motivate this. And here we have S is equal to our universe of discourse. And we have some E here. And then we have some not E out here. Right. If it's in E, then it's not in not E. And if it's in not E, then it's not in E. And so... Uh, the ratio of all of the singletons is going to be one in total, right? So the difference between the two, right, or the addition of the two should add up to one. So the difference, right, from one should be the other. All right, our last example here, and then we'll take a break. Uh, let E1 and E2 be events in our sample space. And then we can compute the union of these two events, right, as the probability of event one plus the probability of event two minus the probability of their intersections. Right? Again, here, this is simply related to the inclusion-exclusion principle and counting right, cardinalities of sets with non-empty intersections. This is a simple corollary of that, since all we're doing is creating ratios of these counts, ratios of these cardinalities. Right? I encourage you to try a proof as an exercise. Right? Again, it just simply follows from the principle of inclusion, exclusion, and cardinality of sets. If you guys want to take the break now and do the examples, or do you want to take the do the examples? I'm going to take a break. Example first. Example seven point five. Oh, should we have a vote? No, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so what is the probability of rolling an odd or a prime number? Right. Again, here we'll assume that we're rolling a fair six-sided die. Right. Note here that, logically speaking, we can determine the number of outcomes that meet our logical criterion here. Right. In a more general sense, we might not be able to list out all of these outcomes or count them, but we might be able to do so easily in terms of the individual events. So note here we have a compound event that we're building from two constituent events. Right. We want to know the probability of rolling an odd number, the probability of rolling a prime number. And here we have a logical disjunction connecting the two events. Right? We want to know the probability of rolling an odd or rolling a prime. Right? We could simply list out this E, right? Uh, that is identify numbers that are, that are odd or prime, or we could create two events. Event one could be all of the odd outcomes. Event two could be all of the prime outcomes then we can do a logical or right? within our sets and comp, uh, building of sets, this is a union of sets, a union of outcomes. Right, so here, let's let E1 
be our odd outcomes. I need to be prime outcomes. All right, so how many odd outcomes are there? I mean, we have our one, three, and five. I mean, our prime outcomes, we have two, three, five. Did I miss any? Oh. All right, so here we'll say E is simply the outcome where we have an odd or a prime number. So this is, logically speaking, this is a disjunction. This translates to a union of sets. So E1 is simply E, or E is simply E1 union E2. In terms of cardinality, how could we compute this? And again, if we knew the cardinality of E1 and E2 and the cardinality of the intersection, we could compute the cardinality of E without listing out all of these items. First, we'll list them out because we have the ability to. It's a really small set. But then we will go through right, uh, an exercise of how we might be able to determine the cardinality of E as long as we know the cardinality of E1, the cardinality of E2, and the cardinality of their intersection. Right, without having to know the actual constituents or not being able to list out the elements in these sets. Right here, of course, we can see that this is going to be one, two, three, and five. Right, however, if we knew the cardinalities of E1 and E2, Right. Then we know that this is simply going to be equal to the cardinality of E1 plus the cardinality of E2 minus the cardinality of E1 intersection E2. Right. In this case, this was what? Right. This was 3 plus 3. Right. And then what? Minus equals four. All right, we can also see this using our probability theory. So this is why this follows. And right, this is essentially the proof of this theorem. We're doing it via an exercise here. Right, the probability of E1 union E2. simply equal to the probability of E1 plus the probability of E2 minus the probability of E1 and E2. Why? Because all we're doing is this exact same, we're applying this exact same rule above, except dividing it by our constant S, sorry, the cardinality of S. Right. What is the probability of E1? This is simply 3 over 6, right? That's this 3, right, over 6. 3 over 6 minus 2 over 6. Right? All we're doing is directly applying the principle of inclusion exclusion. Plus 3 over 6 minus 2 over 6 and equals 4 over 6, 2 thirds. Any questions about that? It's easy, right? Because you guys are expert counters. All right. Let's go ahead and take our break. Uh, when we come back, we will do an example of negation, and then we'll dive into probability theory and formally define our probability distribution function.
All right, guys, we'll go ahead and finish up our discussion of discrete probability, at least for today. Uh, we're going to do our one last example of combining events here with computing the following. By combining events here, we're taking the negation or the complement of an event. What is the probability of not rolling a one? We can do this in terms of, or we can compute this in terms of probability of rolling a one. And here that given our property, we know that the probability of not E is equal to one minus the probability of E. All right, we know the probability of rolling a one. And we'll say that E is rolling a one and it was equal to one over six. And I'll explicitly note this here. E is defined to be rolling a one. And not E is not rolling a one. Right, thus we have P of not E equal to one minus one over six or five over six. This is intuitive because not E is simply two, three, four, five, all the way up to six. And five elements here. And E is equal to one, the set containing one. Not E is simply the rest. And so if we had our set or our universe of discourse, our sample space S, and again, we have all of these outcomes possible. And here we have E rolling a one. If this is not E. And we have five elements in there. We're just subtracting one from six. And we have five remaining and creating a ratio of five out of six. Again, I think those are pretty straightforward. Again, make sure whenever you go to answer a question, identify your sample space, identify the event under consideration. And now we'll generalize these concepts, concepts and discuss a probability distribution function. Right, Rosen bounces back and forth between notation, discussing probabilities and probability mass functions and sort of abuses notation slightly. Here, I'll just keep the same notation and assume that our probability distribution function is defined on the power set of our sample space as it has been thus far, rather than switching it up as we move through the chapter. And right, so here we'll define P, our probability distribution function. And maps subsets. of S to range 0, 1, and thus providing us a probability. More formally, we can say that P maps from and our power set. Here I'm using 2 to indicate the power set of S to the range 0, 1. All right. However, there are some extra considerations here. Note that for all S and S, P of S, and here I'm going to add our set notation, again, because we've defined our probability function on our events, which are subsets of our sample space. Again, this is where Rosen uh, slacks off. 
the notation or jumps to the probability mass function and differentiates it non explicitly from the probability measure. All right. I'm going to make some room here. All right. These probabilities must be between and zero and one. Oh, color. All right. For all of our singleton elements, right, the probability. And so this is a uh, one constraint or one property of our probability distribution. Another is that the probability of the empty set is equal to zero. I'd say something has to happen. I roll a die and then nothing happens. Something has to happen. Right. And then the probability, uh, the sum of the probabilities for all of the singletons is equal to one. So here we say that the sum of all s and s, here when I'm saying s and s, this is a lowercase s and an uppercase s. These are all the singletons in our sample space. So lowercase s and uppercase s. And of p of s is equal to one. So the sum of all the probabilities of the individual events to the individual singletons is equal to one. Right, note that this allows us to generalize and assign non-equal probabilities to the individual events in our sample space by defining our probability distribution appropriately. Right. One of the probability distributions that's commonly used is the uniform probability distribution. All of the examples we've used before assume a uniform probability distribution that each outcome is equally likely. And so a uniform probability distribution is one of the following. Right. Let's assume that S equal N, the cardinality of S equal N. And then for all S in S, again, this is little s and big S, probability of s is equal to 1 over n. And note that this is exactly what we were doing in our previous instance. We were just counting the singletons. This is what we're doing here. We're saying the probability of some singleton s is just simply 1 over n, which is just the cardinality of that singleton set 1 over the cardinality of the sample space n, 1 over n. And observe that if we were to sum over all the singletons, we would get a probability of one. And that is if we have the sum of all s and s, p of s. And this is just simply equal to the sum of s and s of one over n and substituting in from our assumption, the definition of the uniform probability distribution. Right. Note that one over n is a constant. We can simply pull this out and all we're doing is summing over one. This is just equal to the sum of s and s of one over n. And we know that there are n elements in s, so we're summing one n times. This is simply equal to n over n. This is just equal to one. And so what is this telling us? If we were to sum up the probability of all of the individual samples in our set, the total probability is one. And next we will discuss conditional probability unless there are any questions. Conditional probability. All right, so in conditional probability, we are given right, some extra information or our probabilistic estimate is conditioned on some assumption right, on some event occurring. So in this particular definition, we're going to define two events, E1 and E2, and then we'll define the conditional probability of E1 given E2. And so let E1 and E2 B events 
women sample space. Yes. We assume the probability of E2 is not equal to zero. And then we can find the conditional probability of E1 and E2. And then we'll go ahead and write it out. Note that notationally, this is generally written as follows, the probability of E1. Then we use the vertical bar yet again. This is what now the third or fourth use of the vertical bar for different reasons. And this, this is now red given. And so this is the probability of E1 given E2. And so note that this is our definition of conditional probability. And it is read as given. That is a G E V E N. G I V E N, excuse me. Right. And this is simply equal to the probability of E1 intersection E2 over the probability of E2. Right. So, what does this mean conceptually speaking? This is the probability of event one conditioned on event two. And again, to expand that out or provide some more intuition of this, what does this mean? This means that given that E2 has occurred, given that we know E2 has occurred, like what's the new probability or our probabilistic estimate of E1? So without any information, we wanted to get the probability of E1. This is conditioned just on our sample space. So given that we know the outcome's coming from our sample space, like what's the probability of E1? And that's just the definition of probability of E1. Here we're saying we have a little bit more information. Given that we know that E2 has occurred, that is the outcome is in subset E2, what's the probability that E1 occurs? Right, this is equal to right, the probability of both E1 and E2 occurring, that is the intersection of E1 and E2, divided by the probability of E2. And to provide some more intuition to this, we can use a Venn diagram to illustrate what's going on here. Again, here our sample space S is our universe of discourse. We have two events that have occurred. We have E1 and E2. If we know that E2 has occurred, given E2 has occurred, then we know that we are now in, we've eliminated everything outside of E2 or the complement of E2. And so we know that E2 has occurred. And so we have a new, in a sense, a new universe of discourse isolated to just E2. So now we want to know what's the new probability of E1. Right? Well, all of the items in here can no longer occur. They're not possible because we've stated we're conditioning this on the assumption that E2 has occurred. So our new estimate of E1 right, are simply the ratio of items in here or the measure of items in here over the measure of the items in E2. Thus, the probability of E1 and E2 occurring, right? That's the items here in intersection E1 and E2, right? Divided by, right, our new ratio divided by the probability of E2. Any questions about that? Again, conceptually speaking, this is essentially what we're doing is changing our sample space, S, to be E2 when we're computing the probability. Are you sure? Sometimes there's questions for this in the conditional probability. We're going to rely upon this in our next lecture in discrete probability. We're going to look at uh, Bayes' theorem and Bayesian updating, and all of this is going to rely heavily on your understanding of conditional probability. So if you have questions about them, you can ask them now or later. All right, so I think that's some good intuition and something to think about when you look and see that conditions, the condition bar or the given assumption, right? In a sense, we're re-updating 
we're changing, we're altering our sample space, and we're re-estimating the probability of our events conditioned on that assumption. And so let's do a few examples now looking at this. And what is the probability of rolling a five given that you've rolled an odd number? Given an odd roll. All right, so here we have two events we're conditioning, and we're assuming that one of these events have occurred. So, given that we've rolled an odd number, so in a sense, we're now reducing our sample space to this event space, E2. What's the probability of rolling a 5? What is our updated probability that we've rolled a 5? And right, so, note here that initially, Right, the probability of rolling a five right, was equal to what? One over six. And why? Well, of course, we had our initial E1. This is rolling a five. And then this is simply the set that contains a five. Right, if E2 is the probability of rolling rolling an odd, and this is our event space of 1, 3, and 5. So note that our sample space, in a sense, is no longer, no longer has a cardinality of 6 because we've eliminated three of the outcomes, all of our even outcomes. Now we're just left with the odd outcomes. So given that E2 has occurred, given that we know that we gained some information, you can see that it's see this as gaining some information so we can update our probabilistic estimate of E1. And given that we know that we've rolled an odd number, given we know that event 2 has occurred, what is our now, now our new probabilistic estimate of E1? And so what is P of E1 given E2? Right. This is simply equal to probability of E1 intersection E2 over the probability of E2. Again, we could look at it and just do the ratio explicitly from here and see that we're going to get one third. And or we can apply our rule here and compute it in terms of probabilities rather than ratios of the resulting sets. And here we have the probability of E1 and E2. This is equal to that's the set of five which is just simply 1 over 6. And that's the probability of E1 intersection E2. You guys with me? And I did a few steps there in one line, but again, I think you guys have seen enough examples where, where that's okay. Right here, we can compute the probability of E2, which is 3 out of 6. And this is simply equal to and we can cancel sixes here, and we simply get one over three. Note that we could come to this realization by simply creating a ratio of these explicitly. And given their intersections, given that the cardinality of the intersection of E1 and the cardinality uh, O and E2 is simply equal to the cardinality of E1. Okay. Right, the last concept we'll talk about today is independence. Two events, let's say events E and F, are independent. We say that they're independent if and only if the probability of E intersection F is equal to the probability of E times the probability of F. 
what does this mean? Well, let's observe the following. Right, observe that we have P of E1 intersection E2. over P of E2, that is our definition of P of E1 given E2. Note that if we substitute in this conditional dependence, independence here, Right, that we have the following. This is equal to the probability of E1 times the probability of E2 and over the probability of E2. Note that this simply cancels and we're left with the probability of E1. So what does this mean? I note here that when we say, when we re-update or re-estimate the probability of event one conditioned on event two, right, that probability did not change. So given that we know event two has occurred, has not changed our estimate of event one. In a sense, it had no effect on E1. In a sense, these two events are independent. Given that we know that event two has occurred, does not affect the probability of event one occurring. Right. Note given this equation, this also implies, and we'll say also observe. Right. Given this right, and this portion of our equality, we simply have that P of E1 and E2 is simply equal to the product, right, which was our definition initially. All right, let's do an example. And in this example, let's say, let's say a family has three children. Are the following two events independent? Event one, they have children of both sexes. Event two, they have at most one boy. All right, are these two events independent? Let's find out. We have the definition of independence. We can check to see whether that equality holds and given the estimates of these probabilities. We'll assume that the probability of having a boy and a girl are 50-50, the same. And so here, example 7.8. Assume a family has three children. Are the following. Events independent. Assuming probability of boy equals probability of girl. So here event one is they have both the children of the both sex of both sexes. And even two, we'll say that they have at most one boy. All right, so whenever we're answering a question like this, of course, the first thing we're going to do is just going to apply the same. So what is our sample space here? And the family has three children. We want to look at these events related to these three children. So we need to know the number of ways you can have three children. And so our sample space.
number of ways to have three children. And assuming boy or girl is the outcome. And so what are the possible outcomes here? We have, let's say, uh, zero is boy and one is girl. And we'll just write this out canonically. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. And you guys could do this without writing this out, I assume. And but we'll go ahead and write it out. And again, here we'll assume boy is zero for this listing purposes, girl is one. All right, so event one was they have children of both sexes. And the cardinality of event one is equal to what? Before we do that, of course, note here that I've listed out the sample space. So S right, is simply equal to what? One half times one half times one half. So two times two times two, right, which is eight. And the cardinality of E1 is equal to what? We can list them out here. The number of ways to have three children. It's, and E1 is. They have children of both sexes. So what does that do? We're simply just eliminating this line and this line. And we're left with six outcomes. All right, event number two is they have at most one boy. All right, such outcomes are that. That's this outcome here, this outcome here, this outcome here, and this outcome here. That count like at most one boy. So it's E2. Goes four. All right, so we want to see whether P of E1 times P of E2 is equal to their intersection. So we need to know the intersection of these two as well. So what's the intersection of E1 and E2? And this is just equal to We have here. You guys stay with me. What's the intersection of E1 and E2? Right, okay. And these are this is the instance <laughs> where. So this is the sets. Event one is they have children of both sexes. And event two, they have at most one boy. So we have, what, these three items? Right here, these x's were negating those two, not counting those two. I can count them here. These are the six. So, and here are the four. Right, where are both of those events satisfied? They're both satisfied here, here, and here. So we have three in that set. Right, so are they, are these two events independent? So if they are, then this must hold. Does this hold the probability of the intersection equal to the product of the individual probabilities? And right, so let's go ahead and see. P, V1, and P of E2, does this equal P times E1 intersection E2? Right, so here we have E1 is 6 over 8, E2 is 4 over 8. Is this equal to 3 over 8? What do you guys think? You can cancel some of this stuff out here. Two here, get a three and a four. Yeah, it looks like three over eight. Yeah. Yeah. Those All right, so it is in fact these two events are in fact independent. And so, if you wanted to know, for example, whether 
you know, what's the probability they have children of both sexes? And you were given the extra information that they had at most one boy. This was not updated to a probabilistic estimate. All right, that is the end of our discussion today. When we come back on Thursday, we will discuss Bernoulli trials, Bayes theorem, and expected values.